So, it has finally happened. Your big break. Prior to this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, you were literally an unknown, starving actor, barely surviving. No heat or electricity, down to your last few packages of ramen noodles. You arrived on the movie set anxious and confused, dazed by the bright lights and hustle and bustle. You looked around and had no idea who the other actors were, what language they were speaking, or even what the movie was about. It was an explosion of activity and gibberish. But this was your one shot. So you stayed on high alert, engaging with everyone, looking for signs and signals from the crew, the actors, the director, wondering who was in charge and what you should be doing. They tossed an outfit on you, gave you your name, grabbed you by the hand, and showed you around. Over time, your various interactions and people's responses taught you how to communicate and negotiate through your words, appearance, and actions, and how to conform, what to say, what not to say, what to do, what costumes to wear, who to hang around with, who to please, all in order to stay on the set, under the radar, and hopefully to get bigger and better roles. That was you as an infant and an impressionable child. You had no idea what was going on, but you knew you had to get people's attention and stay in good standing in order to survive and hopefully to thrive. You know, and if you're like most normal people, to a large extent, that's how you've evolved to function today. And so you may look a certain way, or have unique mental or physical attributes that cast you in particular roles. I mean, maybe you were blessed with strong vocabulary, musical, or athletic abilities, and you probably remained in those roles conforming to your character's traits and behavior, which were reinforced and enhanced by like-minded people in the scenes you moved and played in. Or... Maybe you grew up in a particular place, attended certain schools, adopted various traditions and beliefs, worked at particular jobs. And those social roles and vocations inform what type of character you and everyone else thinks that you are. <laughs> and you hypnotically perform as that character in the comforting roles you've allowed yourself to be cast through your experiences with the world. Learning and reacting, modifying your performances as the plot shifts around you. Because just like in movies, characters are defined not so much by what they think and feel, but rather by what they do. And what characters do is interact with other characters. In fact, that's a fundamental screenwriting concept. You see, the audience can't read the character's thoughts, so screenwriters need them to act out whatever is on their minds. For example, in a screenplay, you'll never read, Robert thought Amy was cute. Instead, the director must see that thought in Robert's behavior, like, Amy tucks her blonde hair up into her tight blue swim cap. Robert watches from the bleachers, transfixed. You see, as Aristotle said, character is action. That said, you are not acting out your life roles consciously. Your unconscious mind is directing the show. It's keeping you vigilant and comfortable in the cliched roles that others have settled on for you, and with the stereotypical emotional reactions that come with those roles.
Let's take a quick look at the human brain, why it does what it does, and try to understand what's going on at a more fundamental level. So brains evolved to guide action, specifically to keep bodies alive by responding to both internal bodily changes and external stimuli in order to maintain a stable condition. But you see, your brain is functionally blind. It's permanently encased in a dark enclosure, your skull, closed off from direct contact with the world. And so your brain never experiences the energy and changing pattern of reality directly. Rather, it gets its sense for what is happening in the environment through sight, sound, touch, taste, smell. It's similar to a child with her eyes closed, placing her hand in a paper bag and feeling an ambiguous object in order to guess what it is. Your brain reaches out and feels the ambiguous, noisy data of the world with its senses. It also feels bodily sensations, which provide additional information with which to make its guesses. You see, it then uses past experiences, its memories, to construct a hypothesis or story to predict what is and what is going to happen. And those predictions, what your brain believes, translate into your feelings. And it's those feelings that direct your actions. I mean, it's a rapid, reductive, and really fearful process, right? It's like, what is it? What's happening? What effect is this going to have on me? And what can I do about it? We rush through the world, scanning the environment, looking for what's different. And then we quickly categorize those people and things and make predictions about them based on what is personally relevant potentially problematic and biologically useful. Endlessly trying to learn and to reduce errors in our predictions, right? So those predictions or guesses are then conceptualized as words and numbers so that we can store them in memory. We can share our experience with others and retrieve them to make future predictions. This is tough. This is tough to wrap your head around. But just remember, you are never sensing what's really there, the dynamic energy of the world. You are only sensing or making sense of what was or potentially is useful to you in the movie of your mind. I mean, if you put your hand in a bag and sense a dandelion, it could mean flower, weed, or even salad. It all depends on what's going on in your personal movie at that particular time, your memories, your desires, and goals. Researchers have even discovered that when, when you're at rest and you're not concentrating on a particular task, there's a network made up of different brain regions called the default mode that lights up the movie of your mind. And unless you're daydreaming, it focuses relentlessly on its self-story, ruminating, trying to imagine what others are thinking, worrying about the past and making predictions about the future. Now that said, and as central as the brain is to our existence, we are only at the very beginnings of truly understanding how it works. Okay, we do know that your brain represents about 2% of your body weight, yet in order to perform its amazing tasks, it consumes close to 25% of your calories when you're at rest. For that reason, the mind is often referred to as a cognitive miser, meaning that in order to save time and energy, you stereotype and use mental shortcuts to make most of life's decisions. In fact, your unconscious mind is running your show more than 80% of the time. And where do you think your mind got its script, its unconscious programming? 
from your director, from all of your previous experiences and interactions with the world. For example, let's say you desire to play the piano. So you'll take lessons using your conscious mind and eventually your unconscious mind will know how to play the piano. The same with tying your shoes or driving a car or giving a speech. Your conscious experiences with the world and with others condition your unconscious mind and then you go on autopilot and follow those scripts. Yes, thinking or reasoning happens consciously, like when you're solving a math problem, but thinking also occurs unconsciously. It's how your mind sees patterns, creates expectations, makes meaning and forms beliefs. Again, all in a primitive attempt to keep you in control and to keep you safe. I mean, let's say someone asks you to give a speech to a large group of people. Your conditioned feelings will immediately kick in, most likely a stress response based on sensing that your social survival is being threatened. Those feelings, which create your perception of reality, are then rationalized and amplified by your thinking mind below your own level of awareness. It's not effortful and conscious. You don't pause with innocent awareness and thoughtfully consider the proposition. You run it through your unconscious script. Think of it like this. When you're born, everyone around you starts handing you little notes, tiny scripts, these notes represent their ideas about the movie called Life, especially how not to stand out, how to be acceptable to others on the movie set and stay safe and secure. The notes define what's good and bad, right and wrong. There are how-to notes and how-not-to notes, what to do and what not to do notes. Before long, these notes start piling up and become too numerous to consciously hold on to and carry around. And so, you categorize and organize them. And then you memorize the script, turning it over to your unconscious mind. Now, some of the notes were valuable, like the one called How to Read. But most were bullshit, like You Can't Do That, or You Shouldn't Do That. See, those scripts are really strange. At first, you hate them. Stop handing me those damn notes, right? You see little kids. Then you accept them and get used to them. Enough time passes, you find yourself depending on and even defending those scripts. I mean, how else would you know what to do, right? Now, I once thought that if any group of people were aware of this crazy and stifling paradigm, it must be seasoned actors. I mean, after all, they're intimately aware of their professional scripts, their mental make-believe, as well as the powerful effect their roles have both on themselves and on others. I mean, they've been repeatedly exposed to the intricate workings of their own minds and of the compelling illusion created by their performances on screen. They know that the characters they portray and their bigger-than-life personas aren't who they really are. They've seen how it's all manufactured by the screenwriters, the director, the makeup artists, the marketing and PR teams. They know it's all smoke and mirrors. I mean, they've seen the men and women and technology behind the proverbial curtain, right? But then I realized something. <laughs> They're as hypnotized as everyone else. Perhaps more so because it's their personal stories that keep actors spellbound, like people who watch their movies. 
delusional, highly emotional mental movies about themselves in their own minds, which get amplified by their director, the external world of fans, agents, media, entourage, family, critics, you name it. And no one exposed it in a more visceral way than Sally Field during her acceptance speech for her Academy Award back in 1984. She said, I've wanted more than anything to have your respect. The first time I didn't feel it, but this time I feel it. And I can't deny the fact that you like me. Right now, you like me. <laughs> Guess what? The more than 6,000 members of the Academy, they didn't like Sally Margaret Field. In fact, most of them never had met her. What they liked was her acting performance in the film Places of the Heart. Robert Benton, Sally's director in that movie, may have controlled Sally's conscious thoughts in her behavior during her award-winning performance, but it was Sally's unconscious thoughts, her personal, invisible, mental director, the one in control of the self-important movie in her head, that caused her, like many other successful public persons, to feel like a fraud and to crave acceptance. They all wonder, am I good or am I just lucky? They simply don't realize that it's both. You see, actors and actresses, they don't take on intentional roles for movies and then consciously step out of them into a relaxed state of equanimity as their authentic selves. I mean, if they did, then the movie-making scene would be positive, equitable, loose, and fun. I mean, instead, the industry and the public keeps them in obsessively anxious roles as serious and significant movie star characters in the absurd movie in their heads. Yes, the Hollywood environment fuels that delusion and the resulting psychological fallout. But the truth is we all feel it. I mean, we're all full of ourselves to one extent or another. In the early 1990s, the American stand-up comedian Jeff Foxworthy released a comedy album called You Might Be a Redneck If. And it's a hilarious take on himself, his family, and his friends and his southern surroundings. And like with one-liners like, uh, if you think a turtleneck is a key ingredient for soup, you might be a redneck. And if the gas pedal on your car is shaped like a bare foot, you just might be a redneck. <laughs> well, guess what? If you're obsessed with your car because you're worried about what other people may think of you, you might be a hypnotized character in a serious mental movie. If you find yourself at a subway stop ruminating on the past or worrying about the future, you might be a serious character. And if no one really understands you, and everyone who disagrees with you is either ignorant, an idiot, or a selfish manipulator, you just might be a seriously deluded character. In the next session, you'll be introduced to the voice in your head that keeps you in that self-important character role and who is responsible for most of your decisions and your worries. He's the loudmouth controlling director of your movie who views the world through safety glasses. And in order to help you truly understand him, recognize him when he appears in your mind, and internalize his voice, we've given him a name, a famous name, one that you will never forget. <laughs>